good morning to everybody. Um, so happy that it's lovely in the air, isn't it? And we thank God for that. Um, I only have a few quick announcements that I need to, to, to share with you. And before I do that, um, I acknowledge the presence of Brian and Mavis. Brian and Mavis are there. Welcome. <laughs> And I also acknowledge the presence of Elizabeth, John, and Kenny the dog. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I love that. And uh, we're glad to see Joel as well amongst us today. Yeah. <laughs> and my friend right at the top there, that's uh, Claire, is it? Helen. 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 Helen, yeah, right at the top there. Can you hear me, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Helen is right at the top there. Uh, Helen is not been that great, and we will continue to pray for her. But thanks very much, everyone, for coming. And um, <coughs> apologies to those who have been looking forward to tonight's um, uh, Sun Live. Um, it's been cancelled um, for some uh, reasons, which I shall not share with you this morning. Um, but uh, we, are, we apologize for that. And Dave Ryder is leading uh, the next Sunday's meeting as our officers are away on, on holiday. That's all I have for you this morning. Thank you. Good morning to you all. It is good to be here on this beautiful uh, spring morning to worship the Lord together. It's good for us to have our new Divisional Commander. The last time you saw him, he was an Assistant Divisional Commander. Uh, he's taken a step up from there, uh, made a habit still. Um, and uh, for your information, although I'm sure that um, somebody at DHQ will provide us a poster at some point, uh, the official, official welcome and installation of our new Jewish Commander will be happening on the 12th of May at Doncaster um, at 4.30. It's a Sunday, 4.30 at Doncaster will be the official um, installation of welcome uh, for Major Alley. And uh, the Territorial Commander is going to do that. Yes, so put that in your diary and hopefully we will receive a poster to remind you all at some point. But give him a, word, uh, a welcome as he comes to lead us in work. Thank you very much, Linda. Good morning, friends. It's really good to be here. It's really good to be here for worship on what is a bright and a sunny but a somewhat blustery day. I don't, you know, as you remember, if you've all had opportunity to address the hair issues um, from the wind, I certainly had to address it when I came in. My eyebrows were everywhere. But um, it's good to be here. We are here to worship um, our Lord this morning. The week after Easter, this time last week, were you all greeting each other with a He is risen? Amen. Uh, hallelujah, and He is risen indeed. Well, I'm here to tell you this week, He is still risen. And the continuation of the Easter story will be our focus this morning as we worship. But we're going to start worship by singing a great old hymn together. It's one of my absolute favourites. Over a thousand tunnels to sing my great Redeemer's praise. For years, I misunderstood this song. For years, I thought this was us as a people hankering after and having the desire that there would be a thousand people meeting together that we might sing God's praise. And then suddenly, one day as I was singing, the penny dropped. This isn't about the numbers. This is about capturing the fact that even if I had a thousand tongues, that still wouldn't be enough to actually speak of how good God is. That wouldn't be enough to capture all the praise that he is deserving. But we're in the mood for praising, aren't we? See, love races at Centenary has set the tech, the feet tapping, has set the pulses racing. We're ready to stand and praise our God this morning. We're going to use the tune of Boomspeak, which means we repeat the last couple of nights. If you're not familiar with that, just listen up to something that is. But we're going to stand if we're able and we're going to sing these verses straight away through the <laughs>
captures the triumphant nature of who God is and our response to him. This great God who is redeemer of the world and our response is that we simply want to come and sing his praise together in worship. And there's that recognition that his blood can make the foulest clean, the greatest sinner in the world, but then how do we rank with all of that? Because sin is sin. And we are all sinners redeemed by grace. So we unite our testimony in singing, his blood avails for me. I want to share some words from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 13. And these are verses that very often I would use as a benediction at the end of worship. But in the context of how we've just begun worship, in the recognition that God as Redeemer has saved us in through the precious blood of Jesus, I'm going to use this to set the tone for our worship this morning. Hebrews 13, verse 20. May the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. My prayer for worship this morning as we share together on this first Sunday after Easter, when we continue to look at the resurrection experience of those disciples in those days immediately following, I pray that as we worship together, as we look at the Word together, that God will simply equip us with everything good for doing His will in the world today. That, we might, that he may work in us what is pleasing to him. I hope, I pray, that as you've come to worship today, you've come with that sense of anticipation. You've come with that desire that he is truly going to move among us as we worship him. And that he will speak into your mind so that actually we will be intellectually challenged by what we hear. But much deeper than that, that he will, we will allow him to reach into our hearts and simply minister grace to us. Working in us what is pleasing to him in worship together. And to do that, we're going to truly just focus upon him. We're going to sing a couple of songs together. And we're going to start by simply saying we want to put our focus totally and solely upon Jesus, this beautiful name, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Lamb that was slain. Joy and peace and strength and hope and grace that blows all fear away. Jesus. What a beautiful name. We're going to stand together as we sing these verses through. Grateful for the help of the worship and the peace. Let's stand together as we sing these verses.
make our response to this beautiful man, this Redeemer, the Son of God, the Son of Man. We're going to sing together when I look into your holiness, when I gaze into your loveliness, when all things that surround me are shadows in the light of you, when I found the joy of reaching your heart, when my will becomes enthroned in your love, when all things that surround me are shadows in the light of you, what's our response? I worship you. The reason I live is to worship you. And so let's just sing this through. We're going to sing through a couple of times, please.
Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you that as we gather together as a corporate body, we can experience your presence. We know your presence. We feel your presence. But we thank you for the miraculous way that actually it could be just us, one of us, and you. And our experience will be the same because you love us for who we are. Lord, we pray that as we worship today, we will indeed feel your touch upon our lives. We will hear your voice speaking into our experience of life. We will know your grace surrounding us. We will feel your love bubbling up inside us. And we pray that as we offer our worship, you will find that offering acceptable. For we give it in love and in response for who you are. Lord, I pray for my friends that are gathered. Many people here that I've not met before today, but I pray, Lord, that as we share together, because we share together in the presence of the King, then we are bonding and are uniting. But I pray for my friends here that whatever the needs they bring to worship today, that they will indeed become shadows in the light of you as you minister to them. Lord, we just crave a learning experience that we might just discover something new this day, that we might deepen our relationship with you. And so, Lord, as we continue, we simply continue with the overwhelming desire to simply worship you in everything. Lord, we celebrate your presence. We thank you for being here. And we just pray that as we read in the scripture earlier, that you may work in us what is pleasing to you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Now, we invite the please, to minister to us with the music they prepared for this morning.
choice. I worship him. The reason I live is to worship him. Why? Because Christ is all. He is everything to us. Thank you for that choice. We're going to look at the scripture. And as I said, the continuation of the Easter story. Last week, I guess, the focus here would have been upon the resurrection, the experience of those disciples that saw and experienced and questioned and wondered and visited tombs and shared with each other the news. The story continues, Luke chapter 24. And this is still on that resurrection day. We're going to start to read at verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened, and as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened here, there, in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but did not find his body. They came and told us what they had seen of the vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb, they found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going a little further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. And so he went in and stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together, and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. Pray that God will give us an understanding of that word as we continue in worship just now. We're going to sing together. We're going to turn to number 96 now. So I'm going to the screen. We'll have the words. I know they've been frantically typed before, so um, the words will be there. This is one of those songs. This is a song we don't often sing, if I'm honest, or you might do here, because I, I don't know. But it's not a song that I have regularly sung, but it is one of my son's favourites, my youngest son. And when I was chatting into him to the week, he said, what are the chances, Dad, that you're going to sing There's No Other Name But His Name This Weekend? And I said to him, do you know that will fit in perfectly with what I'm going to do? So I've taken the gamble, we're going to put it in. This is one of those songs that if you know it, once you get going, you don't stop. It's not one of those that you pause and read verses because it just flows, doesn't it? I'm looking for acknowledgement for the end, it, it flows out. Um, so I'm going to invite you to stand, and we're going to acknowledge together. There's no other name but his name 
where no other name would do this, no other name but Jesus for folk like me and you. As we are going to sing this, we are also going to set up the offering, so be prepared to share in that particular act of worship as we sing together. Let's stand this.
you so much. That was absolutely phenomenal. Thank you for sharing. You said about that if we might do anything, we're here to worship whatever form that takes. So I'm glad youngsters are going to go out now and continue to worship in a form that's appropriate for them. There's, there's different aspects to worship always, aren't there? Things that really affect us, things that really touch us. For some of us it's the singing of reflective music, for some of us it's the band, for some of us it might be the enthusiasm of the choir, for others it's different things. But the important thing is that we are here that we might worship. The reason we live is to worship. We want to thank the choir for enhancing our worship this morning. We'll just allow the youngsters to leave. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when there's been quite an intense experience, that very often after the experience, there can be a bit of a lull. Do you know what I mean? A bit like when you just had the African choir really enthusiastically praising God for their rapids and their tambourines and their whistle, and then the, the officer stands up to preach. You suddenly go, like, oh. <laughs> that lull has arrived. But it's the reality of life, isn't it? When you have an intense experience, so very often it is followed by that lull. Be it a somber experience, a somber event, and some reflective worship, somewhere where we've been really quite grief-stricken and quite alone, and we've had that intensity of experience, and then there's that lull afterwards when you wonder what's going to happen next. Or whether it's one of those great events, we've been to a wedding celebration, or we've been to a christening, or we've been to, been to a birthday party, and there's great celebrations, and there's a great, great noise, and there's a great buzz, but afterwards there's that lull of, that's finished now, what happens next? I wonder if that was the experience for the disciples. When they had had the intensity of Holy Week, the intensity of everything that happened, the drama of everything that happened, culminating on that Easter resurrection day when there was confusion and afterwards we, we discovered that some went and locked themselves away in a room while others, clear past and his companion, just journeyed home. They had experienced the drama of Holy Week. They had seen the injustice of how Jesus was treated. They had witnessed the torture of, of Jesus. They knew about his death, many witnessing it upon the cross. They had heard the mystery around the east that morning. The, the fact that the women, when they went to tend the body, were met by angels and that the body wasn't there. And then they'd have heard the rumours of the resurrection. And now, for Caiaphas and his companion, there was the lull that was simply the walk home to Emmaus, a journey of about seven miles. And verse 14 tells us that as they were sharing in the journey, that they were talking about all that had happened. They were sharing together all that they had seen and witnessed. And then as they walked and they talked, verse 15 tells us that they were joined on their journey. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognising him. <laughs> And this proved to be a significant experience for Cleopas and his companion. And I want to just take a few minutes this morning to look at that experience and actually discover exactly what the experience was for those two grief-stricken, confused disciples as they journeyed. 
I guess the first thing I want to say about the experience is that it was a time of unlearning, offloading. If, as we read the scripture, verse 17, the unknown companion to them actually says to them, what is it you're discussing together as you walk along? And their immediate response was to start to stand still, their faces downcast, the verse says. And I guess in a moment, as Jesus asked them the question, they paused. They stopped the journey, and the natural emotion that they were feeling, one of great grief and, and not knowing what had really happened, so they, were, they, they looked downcast. But they paused, and they faced down, and then they just let it unload. Verse 18, are you, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem? Do you not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus opened the release valve and said, what things? And for the next six verses, they simply pour out everything that they needed to let go of. They let go of everything that they had kept bottled up. Because it's no good, is it, allowing things to bottle up inside us because it has such a detrimental effect. We need to release things as we experience them so we have a greater understanding of what it's all about. Jesus asked the question, he opened the release valve, what things? And they let it go. They shared everything about Jesus. They shared who he was. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed. He had affected so many thousands of people. They told him about who he was. They told him about what had happened, how that he had been handed over completely unjustly to be crucified, and that he was indeed crucified. They told him about their hopes. We hope that this man was going to be the one to redeem Israel. These are our hopes. We pinned everything on him. They shared the confusion around the empty tomb, the stories of the angels, the stories of the rumours that Jesus was indeed alive. They offloaded it all, they put it all off of their chest, and then the experience changed from one of offloading to understanding. I love Jesus' response to them, verse 25. He said to them, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer? He put turned it around on them. Do you not understand really what happened? And then Jesus takes time. He takes time to explore the scriptures with them. It says he taught them everything the scripture said about himself, concerning himself. Imagine how they would have felt. Put yourself in their place for just a moment. You've just offloaded the great burdens and challenges and experiences of the last few days. And then this man, who at that point was still unknown to them, reassured them, taught them with gentleness and love and compassion. This is what it's all about, friends. Imagine how that felt as Jesus taught them. In my mind, I've kind of imagined that it's one of those times when so much happened and the time would have simply flown by. We've all experienced it, haven't we? Different preachers at different times. Some preachers come in and an hour seems like five minutes. And other preachers come in and five minutes seems like an hour. You know the experience? Sometimes you just sit there, when's this one going to stop? And there are other times thinking, is he finished already? How amazing. I remember once, and it's different for all of us, isn't it? Different people have different effects. I remember when we were up in Scotland, um, Andrew and I did missionary service in Scotland, and there was a man, somebody, somebody here from Hamilton this morning who remembers Andrew and I from when we were at Bell's Hill. 
Some of us enjoy Christmas sitting down here. That's it. That's it. It works all ways, doesn't it? But we, um, but Anthony and I have been strong, and I remember preaching one Sunday, and somebody came up to me at the end of the meeting, and he said, you know, that was just for me this morning, so I could listen to that for hours. And the man behind him who was waiting to shake my hand said, I thought we had. <laughs> There's no feedback required today, by the way, just keep your feel thoughts to yourself as to what you think may have made this morning. But their experience, the experience of clear pattern is, is companion, completely changed. It went from offloading, sharing everything that was troubling them, everything they didn't understand, everything that they'd experienced, to suddenly Jesus putting it all into a context. So they suddenly had this understanding, actually what we've just seen was indeed the redemption of Israel was indeed God touching this earth and pouring his love out through a man on the cross so that we might have salvation. And they went from offloading to understanding, but then they carry on to recognition, realising that the one that was with them was Jesus. The time must have flown by, because they said when they arrived at Emmaus, Jesus looks as though he's going to continue the journey. They said, no, it's late. It's going to be, it's, it's nearly night time. Please stay with us. And as Jesus reclined with them at the table, shared the meal, he broke the bread. In that moment, they recognized him. They saw who it was that had given them this understanding from their offloading. They recognised him as the one who had listened intently to their every need. They recognised him as the one who taught them so eloquently. They recognised him as the very one upon whom they had pinned all of their hopes. And upon recognising him, they realised just what an experience it had been. So much so that verse 32 says they immediately asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us? Was there not such an intense experience in itself? That our hearts were aflame as Jesus spoke with us intimately and passionately, teaching us, leading us onwards in this experience. The experience was so incredible, it says that they actually returned immediately to Jerusalem to tell everything to tell about everyone else. What had happened to them? They had to tell their story. What's all this saying to us? As a group of people gathered in Leeds on a Sunday morning in April in 2024. What's it saying to us? I think it's saying to us, let's celebrate the presence of the living Christ today and every day. Let's celebrate the presence of Jesus. Let's celebrate the reality that the living King is here in our midst. Let's celebrate together that the living Christ journeys with us at all times. Let's celebrate together his desire to be in a relationship with us, individually. Let's celebrate the fact that his desire to be in relationship with us means that he'll listen to us. He'll share in our, share in our journey. He will listen to the, the things that break our hearts. He'll also share in the things that bring us such joy. Let's celebrate his presence. Let's celebrate his transforming power. Releasing the potential that is in all of us to be a missional people in the world today. You're absolutely right. I joke about missionary service in Scotland, but we're all on missionary service. We are all called to engage in this world which is lost and hurting and struggling and fighting and warring and suffering and starving. We are called to be in the world sharing the fact that the Redeemer lives and that there is hope and that there is transformation possible. And that transformation comes in Jesus. Let's celebrate his transforming power. Let's celebrate the fact that he's inviting us to share in his mission. David Bosch is one of my, one of my favorite writers at the minute, and he writes in his book, Transforming Power, uh, that we are all invited to share in the mission of God. 
We are invited to share in his mission. Let's celebrate his presence. Yes, we celebrate his presence with dancing and with maracas and with tambourines. We celebrate his presence with brass band instruments. We celebrate his presence with our guitars. We celebrate his presence with our voices as we worship him because we live. The reason we live is to worship him. We can do all of that. We can worship him by throwing a party of praise. That's fantastic. But actually in this moment, I simply want to invite you to celebrate his presence by kneeling before him in dedication. And saying, Lord, I want to celebrate who you are. I want to celebrate the fact that as you live in the world today, you live in my heart. You share my journey. You experience what I experience. You are there to receive everything that I want to give to you. <coughs> Let's celebrate his presence by pledging ourselves to be found in his mission, in his service for all of our days. Because as the band reminds us earlier, Christ is all. My all in all. Let's understand his invitation to be part of the mission of the world. I say it nearly everywhere I go. Just as a reminder to myself, as much as anybody, that we as the church, we don't exist to serve ourselves. We don't exist that we simply facilitate worship like this on a Sunday. We exist as children of God to be active in the mission of the world. So that actually where there is suffering, we can offer hope. Where there is pain, we can offer comfort. Where there is excitement, we can journey with the excitement. Where there is something missing in people's lives, we can say Jesus is what's missing. Let's celebrate his presence by kneeling before him in dedication. We're going to sing another song together. I think I've spoken enough. And I wouldn't want negative feedback. But we're going to sing a song in which we simply acknowledge the King of Kings. And as we acknowledge him, we respond to him by saying, Your Majesty, I can but bow and lay my all before you now. In my robes, I don't deserve my live to serve Your Majesty. Let's celebrate the presence of Jesus by a kneeling. potential that is within me, I want you to unlock, and I want you to empower that I might touch other people's lives in your name. If it would be helpful, the place of prayer here is always available to come and pray. But let's not miss the moment to celebrate his presence with us in this moment today. Let's sing together. Mm -hmm.
Serving the King who wishes to be intimate with each and every one of us. Serving the King who creates a passion for the lost and a desire to serve within each of us. Father, we lay our all before you now. Father, we recognise that maybe we are not deserving, but we are recipients of your great invitation to be part of your mission and kingdom. We are invited to be part of your kingdom purposes in the world. So Father, as we lay our all before you, we pray that actually as we lay down our offerings, that you would just bestow upon us a power and an authority to go in the world in your name and bring around transformation through the working of your spirit in us. Father, we recognise that that needs to start with us. So we do pray that if there are things in our lives that need to be cast aside, that we would do that. That we would have the willingness to lay everything down, to genuinely offload all the everything that burdens us that we might have a true understanding of our calling to live out your love in the world. Lord, we know that the world contains much darkness, much sorrow, much grieving, much pain. We know that there are wars happening. We know that there are children starving. And we turn to you and say, well, what can we do? And your response to us is simply go and do your part. Live out your faith. Father, we pray that your empowering would rest upon us. That we might truly go and be the people you created us to be. And that the world might experience transformation and revolution as God is seen to reign over all things. Lord, accept the offering of our lives and use us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are going to conclude together by singing the Lord of creation to you be all praise. This is one of those songs that kind of as we go through the verses, captures all of the aspects of our worship this morning. Captures the fact that we are here to worship, to praise Him, but also captures, Lord, all power, I give you my will. It talks about our response to Him. Lord of all wisdom, I give you my mind. I want to think like God thinks. Lord of all bounty, I give you my heart, because I need the love of Jesus in my heart. Lord of all being, I give you my all. I lay before you now everything. Let's stand together as we sing. We're going to sing all five verses, please, Joe. We're going to sing them straight the way through together to the group worship this morning. <coughs>